All right, well, welcome everyone to the Agricultural Technology Platform's Online Software to Manage Risks Workshop Series. Uh, we're really excited to have everyone here today, and I'm really looking forward to learning from our speakers tonight. Uh, my name is Jennifer Hashley, and I'm the director of the New Entry Sustainable Farming Project um, here at Moraine Farm. That's my contact information. My slides are a little bit slow. Um, I'd like to invite everybody who's attending, um, if you would like to add your name, pronouns, um, farm name, and where you're coming from tonight into the chat. Um, you're also welcome to rename yourself. So if you're logging on and um, the name is not something that you'd like to be called by, sometimes people are logging on to someone else's computer or their kids have been on their iPad. So you're welcome to rename yourself, add your pronouns, um, where you're coming from. Tonight, we just encourage everyone to keep yourself muted until the Q&A session. Once everyone gets through, we'll open it up for Q&A and um, we're happy to have folks unmute themselves and ask their questions live. Otherwise, we really encourage you to ask questions in the chat throughout the sessions. Um, as folks are sharing information, if something comes up, just pop your question in the chat and we'll either answer it um, during the presentation or um, toward the end of the presentation as well. And we are recording the session, so your video is optional, but in order to foster um, a collaborative spirit and for our presenters to see who they're speaking with. If you'd like to keep it on, we'd prefer you to do that. So it feels like we're talking to an audience. That would be great. So I just wanna give a quick background about the new entry sustainable farming project and some of the programs that we offer. Um, our mission really is improve, to improve our local and regional food system by training farmers um, to produce food to help um, provide food security for our communities. We're located in North, Northeastern Massachusetts in Beverly on the ancestral, traditional, contemporary, and unceded lands of the Pawtucket and Massachusetts people. If you're not sure where your land, um, what native lands that you might be occupying from your farm, you can go to nativeland.ca and look. So you're welcome to add that to your chat introduction as well. Um, New Entry Sustainable Farming Project um, basically operates three major program areas, our farmer training programs, our food hub, which we'll hear from later on, and our national capacity building programs. So just briefly, our Farmer training programs include our courses and workshops and our incubator farm training program. So we do workshops like these. Um, we do a regular explore farming workshop. Our farm business planning course happens in the fall and the winter. And then we have an experiential crop production course that happens um, on farm during the season. And that also, um, the a completion of the farm business planning course allows folks to access our incubator farm program um, for up to three years. So it's a great resource if folks are interested in learning more. Our crop production course this year will start in May and it'll probably continue to be a hybrid of both online and in-person hands-on experiential training and organic production um, here at Marine Farm. And as I mentioned, our business planning course, we're in our sixth of eighth week for the winter session now. Our next one will be happening again this fall in October if you're interested in looking and registering for that down the road. Um, we do have a lot of um, information on our YouTube channel, and this is where the workshop recordings will be posted as well. If you'd like to take a virtual tour of the incubator farm and learn more about what happens here, you're welcome to visit that. And we'll learn a little bit more about our food hub later on in the presentation, but we do an aggregated CSA program, food access work, and also offer market-based training for farmers. And then, as I mentioned, our national capacity building work is really centered around providing professional development support to other incubator and apprenticeship training programs across the country. So that's a little bit about what New Entry does. Um, this workshop tonight is part of a broader risk management workshop series. We started out, um, we're basically bucketing these risk management categories into different topic areas. So the first part of the session, we covered a lot of legal risk workshops. So we encourage you to go back and check out the recordings if you're interested in learning about um, financing and finding farmland and building a successful and good quality lease um, to acquire farmland. There's some mortgage tools and financial calculators that we talked about. Then we moved into our financial risk management um, sessions. We did a lot of, um, we had a lot of great software companies that presented their um, financial tracking and data analysis software programs around record keeping and financial tools. We talked about transitioning from Excel to QuickBooks and even using point of sales data and software applications for financial management. So check out those if you missed them. And then we moved into some production management and risk management workshops. We talked about other uh, keeping records for enterprise budgeting and for soil health and organic certification processes. And tonight's workshop kicks off all of our marketing series workshops that are coming up. So tonight we're gonna hear from a great panel of Food Hub presenters around 
their uh, successes and challenges with choosing um, some software platforms that work for them. And then we'll hear directly for the next three weeks from a lot of the different e-commerce platforms that um, help with aggregated marketing and sales and things like that. So you get to take a deep dive into some of the software programs that you might hear about this evening. So all of the resources from each of those workshops are posted on a page on our website um, in this Ag Technology Platform tab. So all the workshop recording links and any of the resources that were shared by presenters are posted here. So I encourage you to look at that afterward if you'd like to catch up with anything else um, that we've already presented. Just like to quick, give a quick shout out to our funder, the Northeast Extension Risk Management Education Program. They are supporting this workshop series and allowing us to put this together. And um, of course, there's no such thing as a free lunch. You didn't have to pay to register for this because they funded it, but they do expect us to um, demonstrate that producers learned something and or applied and made behavior changes on your farm as a result of the training. So I am going to launch a couple of poll questions for you. And then after the session tonight, I will be sending you a link to the recording um, and any resources that are shared, but also a workshop evaluation. So I'd really appreciate it if folks could take the time and fill that out so that we can capture your understanding. So I hope everyone can see the poll. It's two questions. Basically the first one is if you could rate your understanding of marketing risks, pretty general question, on a scale of one to five being one, no understanding, number five being complete understanding. And then the second question is, how would you rate your understanding of online marketing software platforms? Whatever that means to you, again, on a scale of one to five. So while you're doing that, I'd like to just briefly introduce our presenters and then I will turn it over to them to get started. So I'm really excited um, tonight to introduce a lot of folks that I've admired for a long time in their work in this space, um, really who all, all of our speakers have a strong commitment to supporting local farmers and making sure that food gets to consumers. Um, and it's just such a great resource that we have in the Northeast here, um, all these great programs. So I'm really excited that they're with us tonight. Um, and this is not in the order that they're speaking, sorry, but uh, Kate Donald is um, a longtime friend of mine as well. Uh, but owner of Stout Oak Farm. She's a certified organic farmer from Brentwood, um, New, uh, yeah, Brentwood, New Hampshire, and co-founder and owner of the Three Rivers Farmers Alliance, um, a farmer-owned um, aggregated food hub. She's been in this, in this work for a long time. And I'd like to introduce um, Beck Ringel as well, who is the new executive director, well, not, no, not new, but I guess it's kind of a new position sort of a renamed position, I guess, um, of Myers Produce, which is a regional distributor based out of Northern Vermont, Western Mass, and goes down to New York City. And then Matt Crawford is the data systems manager at Boston Area Gleaners and the Boston Food Hub. And he spent many years doing lots of things at the Gleaners and most recently really focusing on the data management systems to keep up with their needs. And Ginger Turner, is the new entry operations um, administrator and she's run our food hub before and a very large single member farm CSA. So they're all gonna share their experiences with you and we're really excited to have them here this evening. So I'm gonna turn it over to Beck to take it away and I'm gonna stop sharing. Great, okay. Okay, can, can I get a thumbs up from, is everybody able to see? Awesome. Great. Hi, my name is Beck Ringel. Uh, thanks for that great introduction, Jennifer. Um, I am the executive director of Myers Produce, and I'll start by just telling you all a little bit about who we are. Um, so Myers was founded in November of 2013 by Annie Myers, who was really seeking to connect a lot of farmers who she was seeing with lots of potential for growth to a market in New York City. Um, and ever since then, Myers has been growing very steadily and we are now a staff of 20. We have an administrative team that spans three states, a fleet of seven trucks uh, and hubs in Brooklyn, Hadley, Mass and Hardwick, Vermont. Um, and since 2017, the business has actually doubled to a gross of 4 million as of last year. Um, the core of our mission is really to support Northeastern agriculture. And in order to do that, we, we're working exclusively with vendors that are located in the Northeast. Um, we're primarily working with small scale farms. Uh, we are, uh, that are generally family owned and operated. 
And our main customer bases are New York City and Boston, but we also serve customers in Western Mass, Connecticut, and Vermont. Um, lots of the customers we work with are small brick and mortar locations that are retailers and restaurants. I joined the team in 2017 after working for a few years with a large uh, produce distributor on the West Coast called Veritable Vegetable. Um, they worked exclusively with organic producers. I had never lived in the Northeast before and was really excited to join a small and growing team and learn all about agriculture in a brand new region. Um, and as Myers has grown, my role has really changed. Um, it's evolved from helping in the warehouse and being a sales department of one to managing now two account managers, overseeing our large accounts, assisting with sort of bigger decision making at Myers, and generally acting as a conduit between all the different departments. And so, unlike other distributors, um, Myers doesn't actually work with. Uh, an inventory model. We offer produce harvested to order, which involves a lot of communication with vendors. Um, and it also means that our vendor base and their available items change all of the time. We're managing about 2,000 or more items, uh, individual items from over 200 vendors uh, at any given time of the year. And we provide full transparency of where those items are coming from to our customers, which is really important to them in order to sell the products to their end customers. The crux of our brand and marketing is really to bridge that gap between people who buy the food and the folks who are producing it. Um, so it involves tons of communication between purchasing and the vendors, purchasing and the sales team, as well as sales and our end customers. And through those real conversations with customers, we're conveying the quality and the value of the products we're selling, as well as the general service that we're providing to this entire system. We're really trying to connect the dots that these folks are supporting the entire Northeast system through our, their work with us. And currently we're serving about 150 customers. In addition to our customer facing side, we actually work with farms providing freight services. Um, and this kind of touches on the risk management part. It actually, um, it can make a lot of sense for producers to take on their own trucking, but it typically involves quite a bit of risk. There's tons of expenses, drivers, vehicles, uh, insurance, fuel, maintenance costs, repairs, all that, that can get really expensive really quickly. And part of our business model is actually to take that risk away um, or provide some services so that folks don't have to take on those initial costs themselves. So. How does that translate as a network, a satellite of things to software and digital platforms? Um, the reality is that there is no home run platform for us. Um, we have a bunch of things that we knew that we needed from software that we were going to work with. Uh, our operation has several different unique aspects that make it challenging to plan around this. Our administrative team has always worked completely remotely, even pre-COVID. We work for multiple states, and so we need a system that's super reliable and portable. We have multiple departments using the same amount of information, but different ways, so we need transparency. Uh, often we identify ways in which our systems can be improved, so flexibility and adaptability is really important to us. Um, and easy setup and training on tools that are fairly intuitive means that we can onboard new employees and get folks up to speed really quickly, which helps us um, to be efficient and provide the service that we're that we're providing. We're also running a super lean operation, which means that it's really imperative that costs are kept low, uh, both for setup and maintenance of any platforms that we're using. Um, and we really need pl needed platforms that update themselves rather than on relying on us being on the hook for any reprogramming, fixing bugs, any issues that would come up. Um, so we've settled on the following platforms, which are loosely broken up by department, but honestly, the truth is, most departments use all of these at some point or another, and we all have access, shared access for the most part to all of this information. Our admin team heavily uses Google Suite, uh, particularly Google Sheets, QuickBooks Online, and Microsoft Office for sales, purchasing, and logistics management. Uh, our customer facing sales and marketing tools include Squarespace, which is where our website is hosted, as well as our email platform. MailChimp, where we design our availability list publication and Instagram. And then DocuSign, Bill.com, and QuickBooks payroll are all helpful for finance, customer and employee onboarding, and payroll. 
And then logistics, uh, the logistics logistic side of things uses Routific, Vinx, and Monet to plan routes, track our trucks in case of there's an emergency or in the very many places in Vermont where there's no cell phone reception, and to ensure that our coolers stay at the correct ter temperature to maintain the cold chain, which is super important to keeping our quality where it is. Um, so I'll start by talking about our customer facing platform. Um, our website and email, as I mentioned, are hosted by Squarespace, which is really inexpensive and easy to design in-house. Um, it's there that customers and vendors who are new to Myers can send us inquiries about working with us, and there's tons of information there. We have all kinds of info about the customers that we work with, the regions that we serve. All of our vendors have a, a profile there, our staff. Um, you can even buy t-shirts. Uh, then the next one um, is a split between our MailChimp and our availability list. So um, on the left, we send our availability list to our customers through MailChimp. So that is what a customer will see in their email inbox um, from MailChimp. And if they click the bottom button that says click here, it opens up a PDF of our availability list. Um, our availability list itself is created in Google Sheets. It's updated twice a week. And uh, we really needed a platform that would make it easy to make adjustments um, while also providing information to the sales team about any product changes. So that was that was sort of our split decision to, to make it that way. Um, and our list can be anywhere between 10 and 20 pages, depending on the time. Um, so those, those items change really frequently. And uh, we do rely on our customers to look through that information every time. Um, Instagram is our social media platform of choice. We use it to highlight products and farms and our team or any troubleshooting that we're going through, all kinds of all kinds of things. We tend to get the most engagement on posts about our team and people. Um, Folks tend to really appreciate seeing what we do and how hard that we're working to get them the beautiful produce. It just really keeps us in community with folks and makes them realize that we're, we're real people too. Um, we also feature links to interesting opportunities and stories of what our customers are doing as well. And as you can see in the bottom right, we have little slideshows of, of dinners that people are hosting or produce on somebody's shelves. It's really nice to be able to see our produce in the wild. Um, and then, the real powerhouse is all of the back end work. And our main powerhouse is QuickBooks. Um, it's behind everything that we do. Uh, it generates our customer facing invoices. It handles our accounts receivable processes and sends purchase orders and so many things. Um, there's years of data and tons of ways to, to manipulate it by running reports. Um, and we use it in every department at Myers. So just to explain a little bit of the process, which you can see in the, the little tree um, at the top right in this slide, um, sales processes orders from our customers and then purchasing will take that information to create purchase orders in QuickBooks based on what's sold. Sales will take that information and process it into invoices for our customers to receive. And then our logistics team will pull reports of everything that's in the system to build out our routes to vendor pickups and also to our customer deliveries. That all is eventually captured in Routific. Um, we, I also just want to note here that we don't actually use QuickBooks in the way that it was designed to be. Um, we name our products in specific ways. We actually use categories and subcategories instead of SKUs. Um, and we also use the class field to designate like where a uh, product is coming from. And that's kind of getting into the nitty gritty of QuickBooks. Uh, if you're in that system already, you know what I'm talking about. Um, but that is all to say that uh, it's, it is a pretty flexible system that can be used for, for things as needed. We also have added custom fields to try and make it as um, user-friendly on the back end as possible to run reports. If we want to break out freight orders from customer invoices, for example, we can do that. Um, and the funny thing is that it really depends on where you go for information. Annie was told a long time ago that it wasn't possible to do what we do in QuickBooks, but we have made it work. Um, and it really does work for what we need. We can really quickly and easily, easily run highly detailed reports. And we use all that information to do crop planning with vendors, to do sales planning with our customers, and to just make our systems more efficient in general. Um, Google Sheets, as I mentioned, is another really key tool we 
heavy spreadsheet people. Uh, we use this for processing customer orders, creating our availability list, managing our inventory, and maintaining notes on all of our vendors and customers. It's really kind of provides a backbone to our database on so much of the information that we're holding. Um, they're really easy to create and filter information. They're pretty seamless to use and um, fairly, fairly user-friendly. Um, and then the last one is Retific. Um, our logistics team uses Retific for route design, driver notes, and dispatching. It's pretty cool software. It also provides um, real-time uh, logging of drivers, where they are at the stop, um, and also directions for them. Uh, we're driving approximately 6,000 miles per week with a fleet of vehicles. So for us, software to manage those logistics makes a lot of sense, but it might not necessarily for a smaller producer. And we operated without it for a very long time, but now completely indispensable to us. Um, so all of this combined is a ton of information available to our team. Um, and this kind of gets into the downsides. Um, there's a lot of overlap. There's a lot of repetition. These platforms do not talk to each other seamlessly. Um, for example, Routific, our sales database, which is uh, held in Google Sheets and QuickBooks Online, all have similar customer information. But there is no one button for me to push if a customer email just changes for that to be streamlined, sent to all those different platforms. It's all done manually and involves communication between different parts of the team, potentially, to make sure that there are no steps being missed. Um, we also, uh, you may have noticed, I did not mention any online ordering platforms for our customers because we do not have one. Um, we instead rely on email and a manual order process, which is definitely slower. Um, but even with those issues, uh, the pros, in our opinion, like really outweigh the cons. We've got eyes on information rather than relying solely on technology telling us if something is right or wrong, which means that we can improve our accuracy and also increase our worker skills. Um, this is really helpful because folks at Myers tend to feel really engaged with what they're doing. They sort of understand the process of why they're doing something. And that has been a huge boon to our uh, employee retention. Folks tend to stay with us for a really long time and it's great. And we have people who have moved through departments and taken on new roles and it's really exciting when that happens. Um, all of our systems are really adaptable and flexible too to the needs um, as they change, which has been really helpful in helping us uh, take advantage of opportunities as they come. Um, as I mentioned, the setup is really easy. And especially since we have so many remote workers, being able to set somebody up on a computer at their own home remotely, instead of relying on a technology that like maybe exists in a physical office or on a server that's located in one place is, is great. Um, also our platforms are extremely reliable. Um, there are constant updates and improvements, on, especially with Google and Intuit, and we are, relying on them to provide that funding for improvements and not Myers, which is fantastic. Um, and it may seem really counterintuitive in some ways with such a modern focus on instantaneous orders and folks getting what they need with rapid delivery and customer, customer service through digital platforms. But our slower ordering process, like I really believe that it conveys the world of farming so much better to our customer base. Um, we have this little bit of friction that means that folks have conversations with us. Um, it helps them understand and we can impart the empathy, kind of bridge that empathy gap to really communicate that we are in a fluctuating natural environment with actual human beings growing their food. Um, it makes customers feel good, like they're actually part of this process and they're doing something that's having an actual impact. And also it helps us get to know their needs in a real way. And they really appreciate that kind of extra detailed customer service too, which is definitely what we're striving for. Um, and this is a really important part, but these systems are also really relatively inexpensive. Um, in the end, when you're designing a system or bringing on a completely new system that's trying to fit a lot of needs, you end up not only paying for the setup fee, but you also typically need to be um, staffing tech savvy folks to be able to monitor it, to fix it when it's breaking. Um, and it can be really challenging to do that and to be able to afford the long-term costs of those things. Um, 
to be totally transparent, the total cost of the platforms that I've talked about tonight are about $15,000. And that's comprehensive of everything. That's QuickBooks, Builds.com, Squarespace, DocuSign. Um, all of these have great uh, customer service. They have self-improvement and updates that we do not have to pay for. Um, they never go down. Like I think there's been one moment where we've had QuickBooks go down for a couple of hours in the entire time that I've been working at Myers. It's fantastic. Um, it's great. So those are all really great things. And I will say that through the years, even the five years that I've been here, we've gone through a lot of different trial and error. Um, we've tried several different platforms, including Local Food Marketplace, which I know has been mentioned a couple of times, um, to more obscure online inventory management systems. Um, we've even talked to developers to try and build out our own customized system, um, both smaller developers or in individual consultants to a larger software developer like Produce Pro. Um, fees are anywhere between $30,000 and several hundred thousand dollars just to get up and running off the ground. Um, not to mention the time that it takes to migrate all the data, to train staff, any time that we would be taking off essentially to make sure that the systems can restart and be completely ready to go. Um, all of that costs money. Um, and so, and not all of them are set up exactly for what we need. So for example, local food marketplace is fantastic for producers because they're just selling one product, but Myers is buying and selling products and we were not able to make that work um, for our model. Also, a lot of folks, or a lot of these systems tend to have a um, more rigid system in terms of changing availability. And since ours is changing so frequently, we really needed an as an efficient as possible way to do that. Um, so right now we are working with all the systems that I mentioned. We It's kind of a cobbled together system in some ways, but it really works for what we do. And we're working with um, someone named Matt Tucker from Small Systems Vermont, who helps us sort of fine tune these systems. He's, he's helped us with a lot of uh, sort of as needed software. He's essentially a consultant that's helped us um, make some streamline processes and been really great for saving us time. Um, yeah, that's it. And I uh, welcome any questions if you have at this moment, um, or I can pass it on to Kate. Yes, there's a couple of questions, um, or one question in particular in the in the chat. Basically, if um, Carrie's asking if you're collecting orders via email, how do you handle collecting payments and tracking that? Great question. Um, most of our payments, uh, we prefer at least to come through QuickBooks. So QuickBooks handles all of the accounts receivable. Um, we may be changing that system in the future, but right now it is it's essentially instantaneous. We're not waiting for somebody to send, uh, to like go to the post office and process, process paper checks or go to the bank. Um, it goes straight in via ACH payments. Um, yeah, we also accept paper checks, but most people pay pay via link to our QuickBooks online payment system and our customers don't really need to sign up for it. You can just click link and put in your checking information. Great, thank you so much. Um, yeah, I really appreciate the overview and congratulations on all the growth over the last many years. And you're doing it all with these easily accessible systems and making it work. So that's yeah. awesome, I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks. Um, I think Let's see, I don't think I'm sharing anymore. So I'll go ahead and pass it to Kate. All right, can you see my screen? Not yet. There we go. Is it working now? We can see it, but it's not in full screen mode. There you go, that's it. Alrighty. Great. I'm Kate Donald. Uh, I'm primarily a farmer at Stout Oak Farm in Brentwood, New Hampshire, and 
we have a CSA and a farm store, um, and we also grow organic vegetables for wholesale sales to restaurants. Um, and then just in the last two years, also home delivery. And those wholesale and home delivery sales happen through Three River Farmers Alliance, which is a business that I co-own with three other farmers. Um, we started it in 2014 as primarily a way to distribute local food to restaurants and wholesale buyers. But um, in 2020, that expanded to become more of a more of a thing. So I'm representing both of these entities. Mostly I'm going to talk about Three River and our, um, our software experience, uh, but also hopefully I'll have time at the end to talk about CSA management software that I've used for my farm. So Three River, as I said, um, started out really small. Our first year um, was just a pilot year with three farms selling about $90,000 worth of, of vegetables. And by 2019, we had expanded to about 30 farms and another local food producers. And we were selling about $600,000 worth of vegetables, mostly to um, restaurants were kind of our core customer base. And then when the pandemic started, we launched a home delivery program um, and which kind of accelerated everything into a totally different scale business. And so now we've kind of settled into about um, 400 orders a week um, in southeastern New Hampshire, northeastern Massachusetts, a little bit around Boston um, and into Maine as well. And so we went from that $600,000 in sales in, in 2019 and then 3 million in 2020 and 2021. And so we're just kind of still settling into this new phase of our business. But one thing that has actually stayed constant through this is our software, which is part of our story. So our model, before I talk about kind of what our priorities were in terms of choosing software, um, I just want to talk a little bit about how our model is set up. We're farmer owned, um, still owned by those four farmers who started started Three River. Um, and we have about 60 member producers, farmers and producers who um, all post their own inventory every week and actually twice a week. And they set their own prices and post their own photos of their products and, and all that. So that was a huge priority for us in terms of, we have all these producers who will be interacting with the software constantly. And we want them to be able to do that themselves and have control over all that information. Whoops. Um, and our producers receive pick lists um, that tell them what they'll need to harvest to fill all these orders that have come in. So they're, you know, we also, we, we do also, Three River also does purchase products from farms that aren't in our in our network to resell like a more traditional distributor kind of relationship but most of our products are sold in this way where uh, the producers are harvesting to order um, and then delivering to our facility twice a week and then for the home delivery part of what we do we have a pack line team that assembles the home delivery orders and then we run routes six days a week uh, both wholesale and home delivery So when back in 2014, when we were looking at all the software options, which were much more limited, although there were a lot, a surprising number of um, different options available, we wanted something that was a little bit more robust than we actually needed at the time. And we had no idea that we were going to launch this home delivery thing and that we would become a larger business than we intended. Um, but I'm glad we did kind of go for something that was a little bit more than we needed. Um, as I said, a big priority for us was producers controlling their own inventory and managing that and, and their own pricing. And we were also concerned, we didn't know what the scale of what we were getting into was going to look like. So um, we were kind of nervous about uh, software platforms that were based on a percentage of sales because we thought, wow, if we're really successful, this is going to cost us more than we thought. So um, we were interested in a flat fee arrangement and local food marketplace has offered that to us. Um, we wanted accessible support because the software being a little bit more out of our hands than what Beck talked about, 
uh, we kind of felt like it was important to be able to pick up the phone and talk to a real person because we didn't have, we don't always have control over everything. And then easy customer account management, um, both, you know, just for invoicing and, and payments, but um, just updating accounts and tracking, you know, reporting related to customer accounts was important. And then as it turns out, we also really needed this last thing, which was that the software can accommodate complex uh, scheduling of everything. And that when we started, we were just doing for the first several years, we were just doing um, one big delivery day a week to our wholesale account restaurants and wholesale accounts, and then a Saturday delivery during the high summer season. And now, of course, we're on the road all the time. So local food marketplace um, has met all of those, you know, that we chose them for all the because of all those priorities. Um, we also really like that they're a mission driven business themselves um, with a background in, in managing food hubs. And so we're definitely speaking the same language most of the time um, with the folks at Local Food Marketplace. And their company culture is definitely very farmer centric and they're all about trying to make producers lives easier. And so that's really important. Um, we didn't use routing software until recently, but we're happy that the local food marketplace does integrate with Routific. It's not perfect, but we, we like Routific enough that it's it's working for us. Um, and I will just say they, you know, they're just constant updates and new features um, responding to what producers have asked for. I can't tell you how many times we've someone from our team has requested something or mentioned, I wish this was a little bit easier. And then it's in the next release. So they've been super responsive. They love interacting with farmers and food hub managers. They are on the West Coast, which wasn't on my list of challenges, but it just occurs to me now, I'm often sort of waiting for 11 a.m. when I, it's like a time that's suitable to call someone on the West Coast. I have a few screenshots of um, just to show you a little bit what it looks like. This is a, like a, an odd part of the, I couldn't really get a lot um, of the storefront on my screen to get a screenshot, but this is what the listings look like. And the customer can sort by producer or category of product or by um, organic or other practices, things like that. And I have a couple of examples quickly of what the pick list looked like. So this is what the farmer would receive as an email and also can just log in and download at any time. But once the order period is closed, farmer receives a pick list um, so that our farm crews can go out and harvest all this stuff and pack it up. And then this one shows the pack list, which is the same information, but organized by customer so that it gets assembled in the boxes that are labeled so that they'll end up at the right destination ultimately. And I'm gonna go through this part really fast. If, if anyone wants to come back to this at the end with questions, um, let me know. And then for our wholesale customers, especially our restaurant accounts, this was really, really a huge feature of just being, being able to have a really easy to read invoice with transparency about which um, farms each product is coming from. And of course the convenience of just paying one, not paying each of these individual farms, but just paying the one entity. Um, we found all of these reports and and uh, lists pretty easy to learn to use. Um, I will say like it takes our pack crew at our farm a couple of times, like a, you know, a new person needs to look at it like four times. And then by the fourth time they've done it, they can read it. So it's not, uh, it's a lot of information. Um, This is a picture of, this is back when we used to go to conferences in person. This was in 2019. This is Amy McCann and, and me and Andre Cantelmo from Heron Pond Farm. Um, and 
Amy is um, found one of the founders of Local Food Marketplace and is often the person who's leading a lot of their webinars and is often the person that I end up on the phone with when I have a question or um, or just an idea or I'm wanting to update her on how things are going on our end. But uh, I just wanted to look at my notes for a second. The, in terms of challenges, I think with Local Food Marketplace, the ease of producers being able to utilize it has been such a huge priority that we've kind of been okay with a few of the other challenges, which are more on the customer end. So one of the things that we've realized we've had to do a lot of um, handholding for customers with is it, it takes several clicks for customers to get in to see their, their order period and what's available for them to start shopping. And so they need to register. And you know, it's like everything in the world now where you just want to be able to do it right away, but you have to remember your password, you know. And so um, that's been something that's been enough of a barrier for some of our customers and a frustration that we have created video tutorials to help people set up their accounts and choose the locate the proper location uh, based on their home delivery address or whatever it may be, um, so that they can shop in the right sub period that the software determines is the, is the place for them to shop so that they'll get their order delivered to them on the right day. So the customer doesn't really wanna hear all that or think about it. They just wanna log in and start shopping. And there's a little bit more to it than that. So that has been something that we've struggled to kind of embrace is just that the customers, go, the cust some customers are going to get frustrated and maybe it's gonna take them a couple tries um, to get in. So that's a thing. And, and also customers, and I'm not positive this is still true for, for some time, customers have the same login credentials for multiple local food marketplace platforms. So if you happen to be in, in an area where a lot of food hubs and farmers are using local food marketplace, the customer could accidentally think they're shopping at Three River, but actually be logged into the Startup Farm local food marketplace account and then go to the wrong place to pick up their order if they're not paying attention. I mean, that takes a lot of like not reading your email or, or you know, not paying attention, but it's definitely been confusing. And that's as local food marketplace has been utilized by more groups a little bit. We've seen this come up a few times. So just an awkward, an awkward thing. But mostly we've been really, really happy um, and really grateful that I mean, I honestly think in early 2020, if we hadn't had the software in place and we didn't all know how to use it, we wouldn't have been able to launch the home delivery thing and kind of go for it, um, helping farmers pivot at that time. Um, this is a transition to me talking about my farm. How am I doing on time, Jen? Okay, so we grow about five acres of organic vegetables. Um, we have a hundred member CSA, plus we do a weekly greens box for 40 families. And then we have a farm store credit program, like a buy down textile share for about 250 members. And so that's, this is, this is the biggest our CSA has been. When we started, my very first year was 25 members, I think. Um, and I just used, you know, Google Forms and email and Mailchimp, and that was great. Um, but especially with our farm store credit program, which is the hardest thing to find for that we've had trouble finding software for, um, we've made a lot of attempts at finding the right software over the years. So we've used all of these um, for a year or two. This is. Uh, I think the first two times I switched software, I thought, wow, this is such a disaster. I can't believe how much time I'm spending on this. This is really a hassle to have to move all my information here and set up all my products in here again and learn to use it. And now I feel like I'm much more accepting of the fact that I'm always going to be learning to use new software and, and that's okay. And finding the right thing is worth it. 
So um, I actually really liked things about all of these. And I, I did a lot of research before making the transition to each of them, but our farm store credit program was actually the thing that hung us up every time. And it was that thing that Beck was talking about where systems weren't talking to each other. And we were using like pieces of you know, paper forms where people would come in in our honor system farm stand and write what to deduct from their account. And then I'd have to enter all of those into a software platform. And that was just a nightmare. Um, and, and didn't happen. And so we've, um, I would say I was really happy with CSA Ware, Farmigo and Small Farm Central at managing our traditional box CSA program. That was great. And I probably would have stayed with Small Farm Central, but then as some of you probably know, they um, transitioned to from member assembler to focusing more on Harvey, which is uh, a program that helps you offer customizable CSA shares. And my farm was not interested in that. We just want people to eat what we put in the box. So we decided to not go down, down that road with um, Small Farm Central. And then I, I decided, well, I'll just try for a year just using my website and Excel and see how it goes. And then 2020 happened. And um, we were already in pretty deep with local marketplace. And I knew exactly what how, how to use that already. So we made that tra transition to that and um, have been using LFM the last two years for managing our CSA at the farm. And also we have our own online store for our farm now too. So we can do pre-orders for pickup at, at our farm store. And it was really nice already knowing how to use that software going into that situation in a busy 2020. And that's, these are, this is my team at the farm. Um, just gonna look at my, oh yeah, other lessons learned. I, in terms of um, kind of entrusting your part, a piece of your operation to this other entity, the software company that's doing what it's doing, I think understanding the potential longevity of the company has been something that I've asked myself a few times, like how, what if this company doesn't last or like, what if they really change their mission or like when Small Farm Central shifted to focusing on Harvey and I thought, well, they're, I'm not, I'm not interested in that. So I'm not, I'm, we're parting ways and that's unfortunate. And now it's going to cost me, you know, resources and time to um, make a transition. And so I feel like that is just something that's always in the back of my mind in terms of making decisions. Um, and it makes hearing what Beck's experience is um, feel really like it's really safe to kind of keep control of some of that stuff. But I will say I, I have developed a lot of, we've developed a lot of trust with local food marketplace um, and feel like we're well aligned with where they want to, where they want to go in the future. And they just launched, um, a new app that is even more in investing more in their relationship with farmers. Um, it's called Local Food Connect, and it's going to be its focus is helping. Right, its features right now that they're releasing is helping farmers manage their inventory over multiple sales platforms. So, like for our farm, where we're selling through through River, but we're also we also have a CSA, and maybe we have direct holes like we have direct accounts with food pantries and things like that that we want to track. We could use Local Food Connect to track all of that inventory. So I could use that to make all of my harvest lists for the week instead of having to pull from multiple um, different kinds of software to do that. So I'm excited to try that and see um, how that works. And I guess I would say um, It was really good that we asked a lot of questions at the beginning to really understand what we were getting into, because there were definitely things that didn't look what we like. They didn't they didn't work exactly how we thought they were going to, but we kind of knew that we kind of had a heads up about our expectations. Um, and like Jen said at the beginning, there's no like perfect match. Um, but if you figure out what the prior your priorities are and make sure that those are covered, um, some of the stuff, other stuff. Not being perfect is okay. I think that's it. Do we have any questions? 
Great, thank you, Kate. Yes, there's a question in the chat from Annie about, um, you know, how is local food marketplace on your mobile app or for both farmers and customers? Or is there an app or mobile friendly version that makes it easy for farms to receive orders and customers to place orders on their phones? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the, the shopping experience has, has been good. Um, like I, just recently with the local food local food connect app the experience the mobile experience is going to be better for the producers but um that's new so i have i'm largely log into local food marketplace almost always from a computer and i'm really excited to be able to update the inventory um, from the field and so that's a new that's a brand new um thing that i haven't really experienced yet um, but I, I forget the numbers. I think over 40, I think it's about 45% of our customers are placing their orders from phones. So, and that's, and I, I don't quote me on that, but I, that was at one point, that was the number. Um, so definitely there's a lot of scrolling if you're using your phone because the images are big enough that they take up a lot of space. So you're there's just a lot of products, it's hundreds of products. Um, so when customers learn to use the sorting feature to be able, or filters to be able to look at like, oh, I just wanna look at all the potatoes or I just wanna look at everything from this bakery or whatever. I think that helps the shopping experience. Um, but I know like I prefer as a shopper, I prefer to look at it on a computer just because um, the product list is so large and it's easier to see. But they, the LFM definitely has the, the mobile experience in mind. And Kate, could you talk a little bit? Um, I don't know if I might have missed it, and I'm sorry if I did. If you mentioned like how many people are managing Three Rivers on the back end, it sounds like you really trained all the farmer vendors to get up and running, and so they can manage their own inventory and availability and whatnot. But then, who's? How are you bringing on new vendors? Who's managing customer service, the delivery drivers, all that? Yeah, um, we have our staff right now is about 16 people. We were, we had as many as 25 employees for a minute when we were doing like 800 deliveries a week. Um, and that was purely pandemic driven craziness. Um, right now, our team, we have an accounts manager who is also the person who is the main contact for producers. And so she, her job is kind of keeping tabs on what's being posted on the storefront. So she understands how to make sales to the wholesale accounts that she's in touch with, but also, you know, catching if a producer forgets to check a box and she thinks they probably want it to be available for that sub period, but they didn't check that box and checking in. And um, at the beginning of each sub period, making sure that the storefront is looking like she thinks everybody intended it to. Um, so kind of helping us out and not letting things fall through the cracks. And so, and she's our, also our main um, salesperson for wholesale accounts. And we have an operations manager um, who is overseeing all the staff and then the whole operation. Um, and that position um, was new last year, last November, so a little bit, like almost a year and a half ago. Uh, and so we were kind of, we had kind of had a decentralized structure with the owner farmers pitching in <laughs> up until that point. So he's he's been in the job a little over a year um, and is really trying to get a handle on, you know, budgeting and what it costs to run a fleet. We have four trucks um, that are not always all on the road. We're doing a lot of networking with other food hubs and cross docking with all kinds of people um, in the region. And so he's managing those kinds of relationships and 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 um, all the HR um, and, and accounting and all that kind of stuff. And then um, we have a pack line team who is handling all the products that are coming in from farmers and assembling four days a week, they are assembling orders, all the home delivery orders that go out um, so boxing those up, it's like a big assembly line project, you know, four times a week. 
Um, and then we have a small team of drivers who are out there doing that. So that's that's kind of what it looks like right now. Thank you. Awesome. I don't see any other um, specific questions. Does anyone else want to ask a question or share a question in the chat before we go to the next speaker? Well, thanks, Kate. Appreciate it. Great job with all of the, <laughs> the growth and expansion, especially uh, during COVID. It just kind of created all kinds of chaos for everyone, but it's amazing how many producers were able to pivot and really get directly to consumers who needed it. Melanie, did you have a question? Melanie here. Oh, great. Go ahead, Melanie. Some platform for the apples and so forth. Uh oh, Melanie, I think I don't know if anyone else could hear uh -oh. you very well, but you're cutting out. Um, maybe you can add your question to the chat because I think your audio is a little bit spotty. Sorry, I couldn't understand the question. I don't know if anybody else could hear it or if it was on my end. Okay. All right, well, let's um, let's move on. Maybe Matt can go next. And then um, Melanie, if you wanna add your question to the chat, we can circle back to that um, in a little bit after Matt goes next. Oh, thanks. Share my screen. Okay, can everyone see that? Okay, awesome. Um, yeah, thanks for having me and thanks to um, Kate and um, back for their insight on their platforms. Um, I think we have a lot of shared experiences over here at the Boston Food Hub and Boston Area Gleaners. Um, I'll start with a little background on our organization and my role with with uh, with the organization. Um, we Boston Area Gleaners uh, change the slide here. Here we go. Um, Boston Food Hub is a program of Boston Area Gleaners. And before I explain what Boston Food Hub is, just a little background on the Gleaners as an organization. Um, we've been around since 2004, um, harvesting surplus crops from farms for donation to hunger relief agencies um, with uh, the help of volunteers. Um, and we've grown uh, quite a bit, especially from about the time period of 2013 till now. Um, and year after year, we noticed this surplus these surplus crops on, on farm fields, whether they were, um, you know, there wasn't the market or the market incentive to, for the farmers to sell wasn't there or the quality wasn't quite high enough. Or as I'm sure many of you know, when there's a bumper crop of tomatoes on your farm, most farms also have a bumper crop of tomatoes. Um, so we saw this opportunity to try and strengthen the local food system with the connections that we already had, in addition to a lot of the um, infrastructure that we were building out. Um, and so we, we began this program, um, Boston Food Hub. It was in its, its infancy a few years ago. And really this past year was its official launch. Um, Annie Broad, who's on this call, um, is our sales manager and was the, the uh, did a lot of work on, on getting the program up and running and, and the Food Hub up and running this year, um, as well as many other members on our team. Um, so just in a nutshell, what the Food Hub is, is it's a nonprofit food distributor. It connects, our goal is to connect Massachusetts farmers with outlets for um, produce to additional wholesale markets in Eastern Massachusetts. Um, we work with a range of customers, including other farms, wholesale, retail, and institutional partners. Um, and we try to um, prioritize partnerships with minority owned businesses, organizations in low income areas and businesses that support uh, dynamic food access for their communities. So a lot of that comes out of kind of the roots of our organization in hunger relief, um, but also another benefit of having some earned revenue from the Boston Food Hub is that it supports Boston Area Gleaners hunger relief efforts. Um, so it's kind of a quick overview of the organization. Um, 
as far as technology goes, or actually just to explain how the food hub works. Um, so we were an aggregator and we, we do hold inventory, almost everything that we um, buy from farmers, we bring into inventory and we keep in cold storage until um, it's ready to go out to our customers. Um, I had another point there, I lost it, but um, yeah, I know a lot of different models do it in different ways, but um, that's what I was gonna say. Um, typically we aren't um, buying produce until we know that we have uh, a venue for it to be sold to a customer. It's not always a specific sales order. So it's not sales order drives a harvest request, but it, it is definitely um, that type of system where we we're waiting to order based on how many, how much we know we can sell in a given week. Um, so our technology has been a journey <laughs> um, ever since I started, um, which was in 2013. One of my first roles with the organization was to better track. Um, back then it was just our, our donations, our produce donations and where it was going and as well as our volunteers. Um, and it was Excel and it worked fine until we got bigger and bigger and bigger and our spreadsheet got bigger and bigger and we started adding more and more metrics and it was just out of control and not really uh, meeting our needs. Um, so we learned that Salesforce is free for nonprofits and geez, I can't even remember how we ended up deciding that Salesforce would be the best tool for us. Um, there are a couple other nonprofit organizations that, that were using it. Food for Free is a food rescue organization in Cambridge. Um, and they were using it to track their, their donations in and out. Um, and like I said, it was free. <laughs> so so we, we decided to pursue it to manage our um, farm donations, our outgoing donations to manage our inventory, um, as well as on the food hub side, at, on the gleaner side, we also hold all of our inventory and aggregate it, hold it, figure out where it's going. Um, and we also, at that time, were trying to, or were hoping to implement better traceability for food safety purposes, um, which Excel, uh, you know, unless you're an absolute wizard, it's hard to connect things like that. So um, effectively what we needed was a database and we ended up choosing Salesforce, um, developing it to meet um, the needs of the gleaners at that time. Um, fast forward to now and we're still using it. Um, we've tried a couple other platforms to replace it as we some of the development costs got frustrating. Um, I'll go into that a little bit more later. Um, and just the enormity of the platform. Um, it's, it's a really big company. It's a really big platform. And there's a lot of flexibility within that. But um, as a small organization, we weren't really able to um, utilize that. So um, some growing pains there, which I'll get into. But to explain how we're using it now, um, we it's used across all three of our operational programs, um, Hunger Relief, Boston Food Hub, and then Stonefield Farm. Um, have some water. Um, and basically each of these programs kind of has a custom app that we've developed um, both internally as well as with the help of external consultants. Um, and that's the, all these apps meet our three major data tracking needs, which are inventory management, food safety, traceability, um, and cost and price tracking for the food hub. Um, for the food hub specifically, um, kind of to go over the process flow, you can see the list there of things that Salesforce provides to us. Um, but we are able to, and I should also say that the way that we use Salesforce is entirely as an internal tool. Um, we don't have an e-commerce platform currently um, and everything that's listed there is all internal tools. So our staff is able to create and email purchase orders to suppliers, um, ditto for sales orders. Um, we have a receiving process and live inventory reports for inventory management, as well as um, automated label printing that comes right from um, 
the database, we do a significant amount of repacking, specifically from bulk bins to bushel boxes. Um, but we also did uh, have been doing some um, mixed box packing, which started as a COVID relief program, but it's continued now um, to the present day. Um, we also fulfill sales orders with inventory um, and we have dashboards, um, reports for AP and a, accounts payable and accounts receivable. Um, and kind of the flow of how that all happens is typically Annie um, will place a sales order in the system and she's doing a lot of the purchasing as well, but we have a few other folks who are um, helping with that from the suppliers. Um, so she can, she kind of manages both, but once she places a sales order and talks to the other folks who are involved in purchasing, um, gather who, which producers have, which suppliers have which products and place purchase orders to those farms. Um, we send a truck um, to go get the produce. Um, once it gets in, um, we make sure it all gets recorded. Uh, we always, we have backup paper records for better or for worse. Um, it allows for uh, just a, a backup, but also if you make a mistake and the farmer said you're going to get 48 cases on a pallet, the driver can cross it off right there and say 46 instead of having to fuss, you know, deal with a, um, an iPad and, and all that. Um, and then our inventory manager looks at what's in inventory and decides does it need to be repacked? Is it already packed from the farmer? Would we buy it in that way? Um, and then allocates it or fulfills the sales orders. Um, accounts payable and accounts receivable, the information is generated from Salesforce, but then invoices are sent from QuickBooks. And to be honest, I can't speak too much to that process because it's you know above me, but um, it's we're, I've impressed with Myers Myers' use of QuickBooks, that was pretty awesome. I think ours is much more just kind of the, the simple, you know, tracking in and out. Um, and we do also do some trucking logistics in Salesforce. We have a kind of a side program of helping hunger relief agencies with um, getting food to them that's not our food. So whether it's trucking from Greater Boston Food Bank to their food pantry or um, other arrangements like that. So we truck that, uh, we track that, those trucks, um, but we don't really have a robust um, like rutific or something like that. Um, that's all just kind of done with Google Maps and printouts of where to go when you get there and stuff like that. Um, and then availability list, as I mentioned, we don't have an e-commerce platform, but um, they are sent, uh, they're compiled in Excel um, based on a template and based on what we know, you know, constant communication with the farmers and knowing what is available and that's compiled in Excel and then um, emailed out to our customers. Um, go into a little bit more of that and what we want to improve there. A couple of slides. So here we just have a couple of screenshots of like what a purchase order and sales order looks like. Um, you can see there's one of the advantages to Salesforce is that all, get a lot of custom fields that you can add and it's fairly easy with a little bit of training um, i'm the pretty much sole salesforce admin at boston area gleaners and for the food hub but um, adding and removing fields and some of the more simple database things is is pretty easy to pick up um, we've also added a lot of screen flows so that users don't have to see all of these fields when all they need to enter is two things or three things um, and take screenshots of that. But um, you can see down below on the purchase order side, um, that's where the inventory items, uh, you know, this in the sample, we got some red potatoes um, that aren't yet received, but they're ordered. Um, you can send and print the purchase order right from here. Similarly, on the sales order, you can send and print it. Um, and you can see fulfill the, the order item right from the screen. Um, and you can see some of our tabs up top. And again, it's one of the huge advantages of, of Salesforce is how customizable it is. Every Basically everything you see on here, except for where it says customer and farm supplier there, those are the accounts, which is standard to all Salesforce, but 
everything else is pretty much um, custom, which is also a con because it took a long time to build all that. Um, so yeah, just some future goals um, specifically around kind of external, and just, that should say customer access to Salesforce, um, better integration with our email marketing. We use constant contact for volunteers and donors and newsletters, but not currently for food hub um, marketing. Um, getting an uh, uh, up-to-date availability list on our website or some other platform, um, thinking about online ordering for customers. Um, yeah, so, and these are all possible within Salesforce, but we're exploring the best ways to do it without building out, spending too much time building out, um, you know, something that's too, too robust for what we actually need to do. And yeah, some pros and cons and, and challenges that we've faced over the years. As I mentioned, it's, it's highly customizable, um, but there's not an out of the box solution for food hubs and farms. Um, you would most likely have to either hire someone on staff, which as I said, I've been with the organization since 2013, I've kind of learned this as I've grown with the organization or hire consultants. And there's many um, that we've worked with that are, um, now up to speed on food hubbing and gleaning because we've worked with them and I can, I'm happy to recommend. Um, I also do some of that work on the side. And um, so that there's that possibility, but that's, it's not cheap. You know, it's, it's high hourly rates. They're not part of your organization. So they have to get up to speed on understanding your, the ins and outs. Um, and they're a consultant. So when you need something fixed, you need to get, and you don't have maybe an open, um, they're not on a retainer, so to speak. You might need to wait to get back onto their workload. Um, there is plenty of Salesforce support online, but um, you, again, pro and con. I, a lot of what I learn about Salesforce is a quick Google, um, but sometimes I Google it and I end up down a rabbit hole and I've not come closer to where I was and I just give up until the next day or whatever. Um, so, you know, that's, that's kind of a con. Um, kind of some, some quick ones, as I mentioned, uh, it's free for nonprofits up to 10 users and discounted after that. And it comes with a fundraising and volunteer app, um, which we don't currently use, but I know a lot of folks who do. Um, robust reporting functionality. It's, it is pretty simple to create new reports and um, dashboards and, and all of that. Um, it was originally built as a business to business CRM. Um, so there's a lot of um, the, the core functionality is opportunities and leads and, you know, sales, it's a sales platform, it's in the name. So if you're a really sales driven company or organization, that makes sense. Um, and there's a lot of integration and in, in apps that you can install to um, kind of increase how well it's working for you. We, I mentioned we email out um, our POs and our sales orders. That's a custom or a, a third-party app that's fairly cheap. Um, the label printing is a third-party app. Um, there's millions on their app exchange. Um, and then it, there's integrations with Form Assembly and Zapier to communicate between other systems, um, QuickBooks, things that we want to explore but, but haven't quite gotten there yet. Um, yeah, I guess I should mention timeline overall too. This past year was the, as I mentioned, the launch of the food hub, but also kind of the relaunching of Salesforce for us. We used it for about two or three years in 2016 to 2019. Yeah. And then in 2020, we decided to switch to local food marketplace, which I can echo um, what Kate said, they're really great to work with, um, but it just didn't meet, meet our hunger relief program needs in terms of um, tracking the donations and, and all of that, and needing some custom fields around that. Um, and that just wasn't their mission either. So we had to kind of part ways there. Um, and we came back to Salesforce and launched it this past year. So there was a lot of figuring out what worked, what didn't work in the last year. and now it's kind of to a point where it's it's chugging along and, and working as it should and we're starting to think of all right how can we make this better and, and really capture all of our business processes 
think I covered everything on this slide, but let me just make sure. And I'm not a Salesforce salesman, so I can't tell you how much it costs if you're not a nonprofit, but um, you pay per user and there's different levels of what you have access to. Luckily, as a nonprofit, you get access to pretty much their entire suite of um, like database customize, customization, which is nice. Like I think it's 500 custom objects. We use about 15 to 20 maybe. Yeah, and then you know if there are questions or anything else, I probably missed something and if Annie wants to chime in, she's more than welcome, but yeah, thanks guys. Thanks, Matt. That's impressive. Um, New Entries used Salesforce for different things over the years, and you guys have really customized it well. And I know how challenging that is and how many consultants we've had <laughs> trying to help us get it up and running. We just went through that last summer. So I'm impressed with all that you've done to make it work for those purposes, because we've never even considered it for the food hub. So yeah, great job. We have a lot to learn from you. And it sounds like you moonlight as a Salesforce consultant. So now we know who to, who to go to. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you for offering yeah. that. Awesome. Well, um, it looks like Melanie, I think you got to ask your question in the chat. So it looks like you are looking for resources, um, maybe some human resource um, suggestions. I don't know if folks on the on the call have suggestions for any open source software to record staff movements such as arrivals over time, etc. on a daily basis. And, and thanks to um, one of the respondents for um, suggesting a place to, to go, the new or commons website, but do, do any of the speakers have any other suggestions for Melanie? I actually can, I don't have many details around it, but we just, we're in the process of launching Gusto or Gusto, I don't know how to pronounce it. Um, I use that as an employee at another company. And as on the employee side, it was great. It's just it's an app on your phone and you track when you got to work and when you left work. Um, and all your tax information comes through there and you can submit for time off and all that. But yeah, thanks, Annie. We haven't, um, like I said, I'm not part of that team, so I can't really speak to the details of it, but we, we chose it after looking at other ones. So it could be useful. Right. Thank you. All right, we'll keep your questions coming in the chat and I guess we'll hear from Ginger next. And yeah, thank you so much. And thanks, yeah, thanks. For okay, Jennifer, you got muted, so I wasn't sure if you were. <laughs> I'm oh, sorry about that. <laughs> I was reading the chat to myself. Um, yeah, thanks for uh, to the panelists for putting other responses in the chat. So um, yeah, Beck just mentioned, I'm just saying it for the recording, that Myers uses QuickBooks Time, which has an app for timesheets, time off requests, which syncs with their QuickBooks payroll too. So that's another resource and I'll add that to the resource follow-up. So thank you all for offering that. And Ginger, take it away. All right, so hi everybody. Um, my name is Ginger. I'm the operations administrator here at uh, the New Entry Food Hub um, and the New Entry Sustainable Farming Project. Um, prior to working for New Entry, um, I ran a large um, CSA from a single farm um, at our peak in 2011, like the height of CSA awesomeness we had. Uh, 1,400 members across 20 pickup locations. Um, after that, I went to work as COO for a small um, local meal kit company that was sourcing wonderful produce from uh, back at Myers. Um, and then I came to New Entry to um, manage Food Hub. Um, So the mission of the New Entry Food Hub, is, the Food Hub is kind of our social enterprise. So New Entry, as I'm sure you all know, is the beginning farmer training program. Uh, we have an on-farm incubator program for um, farmers that are in their first three years of production. Um, and the Food Hub serves as a market outlet for our incubator farmers and for anybody that's gone through um, our programs over the years. Um, as, a, as well as other local farms that are, are interested in selling local produce to us. Um, so who we serve. 
I have always viewed my role as serving the farmers. Um, so we provide a lot of technical assistance to them. Um, our farmer group, um, it comes in kind of like two groups, or I think of them as two groups. So we have our immigrant and our limited resource farmers. Um, these are farmers that are operating on a small scale, usually a couple of acres or less. Um, they tend to have um, very limited or no access to um, technology and computers. Uh, they have limited English language skills um, and are unable to <laughs> do record keeping or invoicing uh, for their operations. So we handle almost all of that for them. Um, their strengths, however, in terms of our farmer um, group is that um, they're operating on a scale and they have quality of produce that we're able to purchase consistently um, in good quality, you know, good quality and good quantity and keep the promise moving for the food. Um, our farmers are very consistent. Um, most of them have worked with uh, the for, you know, 15 years um, and are just amazing. Um, our second group of farmers are beginning farmers. Um, so while these guys, you know, can have really strong computer and financial literacy skills and are very enthusiastic, um, they do sometimes have limited crop availability. So sometimes, you know, we'll reach out to some of our incubator farmers and, you know, they'll have five bunches of an herb or, you know, 20 heads of lettuce. So like really small. <laughs> really small amounts of things to be able to sell. Um, consistency is always an issue. You know, sometimes they'll say, you know, they have 50 bunches of something, but then when they get out in the field, they realize, you know, the pest came through and destroyed everything or, you know, with their full-time day jobs, they didn't have the time <laughs> to be able to harvest. So consistency is a problem. Um, crop quality is sometimes a problem, not always, but, you know, first year farmers sometimes get in over their heads. Um, and uh, they just don't have a lot of experience with record keeping and invoicing. So we usually have to spend some time um, providing technical assistance on that. Um, and then on the customer side, um, we provide local produce. Um, so we're primarily a direct consumer. Um, operation. Um, our main uh, route for food that we're getting from our farmers are um, senior food access shares. So these are small CSA shares that are distributed through local council and region centers. Uh, you have a traditional CSA box share program um, that's about 200 shares a year. Um, two years ago, we launched CSA Your Way, which is an online farmer's market e-commerce platform. Um, we had um, 280 individual um, customers sign up for CSA Your Way, but we were averaging about you know, 40 to 50 orders a week, so not huge. Um, we have limited wholesale and institutional buyers. We're trying to grow that market um, and also limited point of sale purchases. So we do one farmer's market and you know, kind of one-off events and things like that. So it's a lot of different share types um, and a lot of small quantities that we're trying to put together with aggregated small quantities from small producers. Um, so we have kind of a complicated setup. Um, so the challenges that we needed to address are aggregating from 30 plus very small farmers, like I said, quarter acre up to a couple acres would be big. Um, varying access to technology amongst the farmers that we work with, multiple share types and market channels, multiple pickup locations, plus home delivery. Um, we needed a um, point of sale payment. Uh, we needed inventory and pick list management accounts payable management and accounts receivable management. So our solution was local food marketplace. Um, and we've kind of like slowly phased it in over the course of a couple of years um, for various reasons, some being administrative and others just being staffing constraints. But 
Um, yeah. Uh, so one of the things that I like about it, um, you know, as was said before by Kate, um, is the producer management side of it is amazing. So before local, before we used local food marketplace as a customer facing um, um, platform, um, farmers didn't have any control over how the new entry food hub was marketing their business or communicating to our customers who grew the food, you know, where it came from, what are they like, where are they? Um, but now they can control their public face. Um, to our customers. Um, they are also able to um, update photos, product lists, availability, and pricing. And now our customers can know the farmers and their growing practices. Um, unlike Kate, we do still manage a lot of this for our farmers. We only have a handful right now that are doing this themselves. Um, but I like the idea that they can <laughs> once they get there. Um, and then also for producer management. So um, before we were using Local Food Marketplace, every week we would call or email each and every one of the farmers that we were working with um, to get their availability and we were updating it on a spreadsheet. Um, now producers can update their own availability. For those producers that were still calling or emailing or texting, it's really quick and easy to update their availability um, on the website. So before the season, we have crop lists from each farmer. We know what they're growing. So we can set up a product list for them. Um, so each week, you just pull up this bulk um, availability, type in the quantity that they have of each item, and, and it's good to go. Um, another thing that's really nice um, with local food marketplace that's worked well for us is prior to our fully implementing local food marketplace, we had a separate e-commerce site for CSA box shares, a separate e-commerce site for our, what we call CSA Your Way, which is the, um, you know, custom CSA, the farmer's market. Um, and we were using a different invoicing system for all of our food access and our um, wholesale customers. So it was really complicated with a lot of information, a lot of different places that we'd have to put together into, you know, one spreadsheet to be able to figure out what we were gonna order. Um, so now all of those payment systems are in local food marketplace. It handles our card payments, it handles our POS, it handles our invoicing. Um, the uh, bulk payment processing is really fast. So during the season when we're getting lots of orders a day, it's just a click of a button to process all of those cards. Um, we're able to set up our CSA box shares as recurring orders um, in local food marketplace. So um, before we would have a separate sign-in sheet for our box customers and a separate sign-in sheet for our CSA or way customers, which was confusing for our site volunteers. Um, we had multiple price lists um, based on whether it was a retail customer or a wholesale customer um, that we would need to update weekly um, and send out to different people. Now, a local food marketplace allows you to um, set your pricing based on the customer type. So your wholesale customers will see different product list and different pricing than the um, CSA or white customers will see. Um, yeah, I think that covered all of that. For me, the biggest limitation is that there isn't any CSA share planning. Um, so I would love um, if I could set up like my traditional box share this week is gonna have these five items and it would capture all of those customers that have a recurring order for a CSA box share and add that into the um, pick lists for the farmers. As it is, our workarounds is we need, we create an order for ourselves um, for all of the items that we want in that share. Um, I'm not sure if this is the best way to do it, this is what we've chosen to do. It kind of messes with our reports a little bit, but 
we just know that it exists and try to work around it. Um, and then once all of the orders are placed at the end of the week, when the ordering window closes, Local Food Marketplace shoots out the um, pick list to all of the farmers via email. Um, for those that we still have to call, it's much easier to have their order put together and to generate um, an invoice to send to Tufts uh, to get payment for those farmers, but we still handle that part of it for them. Um, so before we were again using a spreadsheet to create our pick list um, and the um, producer pricing um, and then calling or emailing each producer individually with their orders um, and letting them know when to deliver it. Uh, now all of that is done automatically, uh, which is really nice. And finally, Local Food Marketplace has really awesome uh, financial reporting. So I really love spreadsheets and reports. So I love pulling out <laughs> reports to see what items are selling well and which ones aren't and um, sales. And there's lots of different ways to slice and dice the information. So yeah, that's, um, that's all I had for Local Food Marketplace. I feel like I kind of blew through that. So if anybody has any questions or um, would like me to pull it up and kind of show you around the back end, I'm happy to do that. Great, thank you so much, Ginger. Um, I don't see any new questions in the chat, but if folks um, that are still on the line here would like to ask any particular questions of our panelists um, or have any other questions around e-commerce or what's coming next down the pike in this workshop series, please feel free to unmute yourself. We're a small group now and ask your questions. And while you're thinking about any burning questions that you have, I'm gonna launch the um, final poll assessment to see if hopefully we achieved something here this evening and you might have learned something new about decision making or marketing risk. So if, um, for those of you who are still on, if you want to fill out the response to the poll while you're thinking about your questions, please do so. And panelists, you're also welcome to <laughs> ask each other questions if that's helpful. Um, I know we're at time, so I recognize uh, we're kind of near the end, but if folks do want to stay and ask each other questions, you're welcome to. Do any of our participants have any questions or should we close out our session tonight? I would love to ask Kate how she manages her CSA on Local Food Marketplace. Yeah. Um, well, like you said, it, I'm not planning anything in there. Um, but we're using it for our signups, which is kind of the main thing, my main concern, just getting people signed up um, and not, and having the, you know, the payments processed easily. We do like to offer people the option to pay by check for multiple reasons. And that has also been an easy thing to kind of make obvious to our customers. Um, you know, our CSA, because everything in, in our shares is coming from one farm, it's such a different process than what you're dealing with. So, you know, we just have a list of what we're gonna, you know, I just make a list of what we're putting in the share that week. And it's not even in, you know, nothing, nothing that doesn't really interact with LFM at all. Um, yeah, so it's really just like member, member management more, yeah. than, you know, not like a weekly interaction with it. Cool. Thank you. I wish there could be a wedding of CSA wear in local food marketplace. That would be <laughs> the best. Great. And thank you, Dana, for your comment in the chat about just really appearing, hearing from different perspectives from different seller types and organizations of how folks are moving local food around. And I think that was, uh, we had a nice blend of both for-profit and nonprofit folks. And all of you have used different solutions to the challenge of trying to make this business of logistics and sourcing from different producers and really trying to build, you know, build an alternative distribution network. So again, I really appreciate all of our panelists and speakers and please know that many other people will be listening to this recording. Um, so a lot of people will benefit from the wisdom that you shared tonight. So um, thank you so much for your time and expertise and all the great work that you do in the world. So 
I'm going to close us out now unless there are any other questions, but I really appreciate you all for your time and yeah, all that you do. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thanks all. Thanks. Bye.